Vamos dar início à nossa conversa realizando um pequeno exercício. Imagine que você é o jardineiro da escola em que trabalha. Do jardim, você observa através da janela as aulas que estão acontecendo durante o período. Você olha atentamente cada uma delas. O que você vê na maioria das salas? Para onde está voltada a atenção dos alunos? Qual a postura do professor? Pense sobre isso. Talvez você tenha observado algumas aulas bem dinâmicas. Porém, deve ter visto outras aulas em que o professor era o centro das atenções e os estudantes, todos enfileirados, prestavam atenção às suas explicações. Em uma aula personalizada, o papel do professor não é o mesmo que vemos em uma aula tradicional. No ensino híbrido, o centro do processo é o aluno, não o professor. Então, como seria olhar as aulas híbridas através da janela? Com certeza, você veria um professor circulando em sala, incentivando e propondo atividades mais adequadas às necessidades dos alunos. O foco da atenção do aluno estaria na sua própria aprendizagem, nas interações interpessoais com os colegas e com o professor. Nosso objetivo nessa aula é proporcionar uma reflexão sobre a postura do professor, considerando a utilização integrada das tecnologias digitais em uma aula. E após conhecer diferentes exemplos práticos, você vai planejar e experimentar uma aula em que seja possível vivenciar as mudanças propostas aqui. Vamos lá? Assim como os demais elementos envolvidos no ensino híbrido que vimos na introdução do curso, o papel do professor é uma engrenagem muito importante. Precisamos refletir sobre o seu papel para que todo o conjunto funcione de forma coordenada em direção ao ensino personalizado. Para darmos início, convido dois professores do nosso grupo de pesquisa são o professor Leandro e a professora Flávia. Você poderia começar, Leandro? Claro, Adolfo. Começo então com uma questão para você que está nos assistindo. Já parou para pensar que o papel do professor está intrinsecamente relacionado com a evolução da informação na sociedade? Por exemplo, há poucos séculos houve um aumento do volume das informações e conhecimentos produzidos que foram se acumulando nas bibliotecas, o que fez surgir a necessidade de mais professores preparados para levar tudo isso à sociedade. Naquela época, os professores eram tutores munidos de elevado conhecimento que era obtido pela leitura silenciosa de muitos e muitos livros. A prática de ensinar era baseada no que o tutor acreditava ser importante, filtrando toda a informação que seria repassada ao estudante. Com o desenvolvimento da tecnologia, mudou a forma de produzir e acessar a informação. Foi a partir de 1994 que a internet começou a ganhar espaço nos computadores domésticos em escala global. Assim, nessas últimas duas décadas, muitos softwares, sites, plataformas e redes sociais foram criados, facilitando a autoria de informação. Hoje em dia, podemos expor nossos pensamentos em um blog, mostrar nossas ideias em vídeos e até mesmo opiniões em 140 caracteres, como no Twitter. A forma como temos acesso à informação foi facilitada. Nos dias de hoje, podemos acessar rapidamente um livro do celular em qualquer lugar, a qualquer momento. E claro, com as tecnologias digitais fazendo parte das atividades diárias, os professores também buscaram levar alguns recursos digitais para a sala de aula. Em muitas escolas, os professores não utilizam mais o quadro de giz, usam projetores digitais para trazerem suas apresentações. Porém, a presença de outras mídias na sala não trouxe mudanças profundas para todos os professores. Em alguns casos, a prática pedagógica continuou centrada na exposição de conteúdo pelo professor. Mesmo com a tecnologia, algumas salas de aula continuam ultrapassadas. Como já vimos, alunos aprendem em tempos diferentes e as necessidades de aprendizado não são as mesmas. O desafio é mais do que uma mudança de postura. É preciso buscar novos caminhos. Um desses caminhos é o que propõe nosso curso, o ensino híbrido em busca de um ensino personalizado. Não é mesmo, Flávia? Com certeza, Leandro. Nessa proposta de ensino, você deixa de ser orador e passa a intervir pontualmente nas dúvidas e dificuldades dos alunos. Professores que se permitiram agir diferente, buscando como aprender e como ensinar neste modelo, garantem que a tarefa não é fácil, mas com certeza ela é possível. É preciso saber combinar as atividades presenciais, que estimulam a colaboração entre alunos e a valorização e humanização da relação professor-aluno. 
A professora Alison, de uma escola do Distrito de Milipitas, na Califórnia, Estados Unidos, organizou o espaço de sua sala de aula com várias abordagens pedagógicas e estimulou diferentes habilidades em sua turma. Vamos ouvir o seu depoimento. Hello, Brazil friends. It's so nice to uh, be associated with your group again. That my classroom was very traditional, meaning that the kids sat at their desks, they opened their textbook. I used the teacher's edition. I taught a specific lesson, and I taught it whole group. And then the kids that understood it went on to practice individually, and I worked with a small group of students. The problem with this is working with the students that were having difficulty, I was not able to analyze each individual student's needs. I basically just retaught, and that wasn't very effective. In addition, I would give a pretest at the beginning of a chapter, grade it, and not really know how to use it to inform my instruction. And then I would give a post-test, and that post-test was given at the end of a chapter. It took me a few days to grade, and when I graded it, anyone that earned 70% or higher was considered passing. And so I didn't work with those kids at all. Again, I worked with the kids that scored below a C or below 70%. And I learned through Khan Academy that kids that uh, score 70%, they don't have mastery of that skill. 30% of that test, they did not understand. So with Khan Academy and blended learning, each student is working on their individual level and they are getting help exactly where they need it. So they're getting, I'm providing more targeted instruction. E realmente, no ensino híbrido, fica evidente que o professor não é mais o único responsável pelo aprendizado do aluno. O aluno é protagonista do seu aprendizado. O docente não precisa mais oferecer uma única aula para a turma toda sem considerar as diferenças individuais. Hoje, podemos utilizar alguns recursos digitais para fazer isso de uma maneira melhor. É importante ressaltar que a tecnologia ela é uma aliada, pois o aprendizado pode acontecer em qualquer hora e em qualquer lugar. Não vamos limitar nossos alunos, não é mesmo? Vamos encontrar uma forma de facilitar esse aprendizado? Com certeza, Flávia. Segundo Mauri, existem três concepções bem distintas sobre o papel do professor que utiliza as tecnologias digitais em aula. Acreditamos que isso é como um processo evolutivo dessas ferramentas. Por exemplo, na concepção centrada na dimensão tecnológica, a tecnologia é usada apenas como auxílio para algum conteúdo que o professor queira ensinar. Prática muito comum nos primeiros laboratórios de informática, das escolas que ainda não tinham acesso à internet. O aluno usava o computador para produção escrita e leitura de textos. Já na concepção de acesso à informação por meio das tecnologias, o professor usa a ferramenta tecnológica também como mediador do processo interativo do aluno com a informação, pois o aluno tem acesso a outros meios e formas de aprendizagem. Neste caso, ele pode pesquisar, ver vídeos, entre outros. E uma última concepção que o professor trabalha junto com programadores e designers para desenvolver ferramentas visando a individualização e até mesmo a personalização de ensino. Essa concepção, focada na construção do conhecimento, se assemelha aos ideais que buscamos no ensino híbrido, pois o professor usa ferramentas adaptativas que vão auxiliando o aluno com necessidades específicas para a construção do conhecimento. Como vimos nas primeiras aulas, o ensino híbrido tem como objetivo construir uma prática pedagógica inovadora que potencialize o aprendizado dos alunos por meio de tecnologias digitais. Mas vale reforçar que a presença dessas tecnologias não diminui a importância do professor nas escolas, apenas modifica o seu papel. Nessa nova concepção de aprendizagem, você é um arquiteto do conhecimento e precisa mostrar ao aluno que existem diferentes formas de construí-lo. É verdade, o uso de tecnologias digitais pode estimular e facilitar o processo de aprendizagem e cabe ao professor mostrar ao aluno como utilizá-las de forma crítica e produtiva. Agora vamos mostrar para vocês um vídeo sobre a mudança do papel do professor no ensino híbrido. As we think about reconceptualizing the role of the teacher for blended learning, we're thinking about five key shifts in particular. The first one is from lecturer to facilitator. Next, it's the difference from fixed groupings of students to more dynamic grouping strategies. The third shift is moving away from being the explainer of all concepts and to the intervener with the student at the right time for their needs. And then from thinking about the job being teaching content to thinking about teaching content, skills, and even mindsets to our students. 
And the last shift that we're thinking a lot about is one that happens in several of the models we profile, which is from generalist to specialist. The idea that teachers can start specializing on those skills that they're most passionate about or where their strengths are. So to make this new vision for school a reality, we as teachers have to go after one fundamental assumption of how we think of our job as teachers. And that's like our core instructional delivery model. And letting go of the idea that we always have to teach something in order for students to have learned it. When the kids are learning on the computers during personalized learning time, it's my job to just facilitate. And it's not my job to like answer their questions but it's my job to proctor content assessments. So all I'm doing is like making sure they're on task and like being like facilitating their learning. And that's kind of like my entire role and it's not to like teach them in that time. It's for them to learn and like learn from their mistakes or learn from their successes. Yeah, and so lectures, though, still going to be part of the learning process. We don't want you to be under the wrong impression. But if you look at the blended learning schools that we're profiling, you see that it's actually for two reasons that the lecture remains relevant. The first one is that in small group settings, the teacher is still clearly leading a class through a series of concepts and exercises. And the second reason is, if we're being honest, in college, students still learn through lecture, and so mastering those note-taking skills and being able to absorb a lecture is important. So in education, we've known for a long time the power of getting students into the right group at the right time. Now, what it usually looks like, though, is maybe the class is divided into three groups, and we'll call them the Cardinals and the Blue Jays and the Sparrows, but a kid figures out pretty quickly, I'm a smart kid or I'm not a smart kid. And that's because the groups are fixed. Those things are set in stone, and the kids don't change. It doesn't respond to a kid's proficiency level, which we know can change on a daily or hourly basis. So the big idea here is what we call dynamic grouping. The groups exist on a concept-by-concept -concept level and respond to kids changing. So they can go from a high to a medium to a low group even within a single week. So this points to one of the big shifts that a teacher will make as they move into blended learning, which is that you're really going to be using data to drive this idea of dynamic grouping or these changing groups. And we would argue that you should be using this data on at least a weekly basis, maybe even a daily basis, so that you're constantly sorting students to get them the right thing at the right time. I'll give you a concrete example. There's a school here in the Bay Area that uses a, a school-created data tool called Exit Ticket. The teacher stands up to teach a concept, but right away gives the students a few choices, questions to see what they know. Kids do their responder, and the students who get it right are peeled away. That onion gets peeled. The first level of kids go, and they work on something more challenging. Then the teacher begins to do some instruction and pretty quickly pauses again, offers a few more questions, see what kids do or don't know, peels the onion further until they get down to the core of the students who really need the most um, magical intervention we have, which is more small group time with that teacher. We reteach as soon as possible, and that's one of the really powerful things about small group instruction is that I teach the lesson in a small group format. Then I may discover that two students from this from group one and two students from group two are missing the same areas. They're both they both have the misconception of lining up the ruler the wrong way. So I can pull those four students again and reteach them just on that specific area. And I know what area they're missing because of the data that I'm able to get so quickly from programs like Edmodo. If you go into a full blended learning environment, it's very easy to imagine that the amount of data you have is going to get overwhelming very fast. Don't get overwhelmed by it. Pick the one source that's really, really good for giving you great data that's actionable, or pick the two or three metrics that you think really helps you drive that grouping and what students need instruction-wise next. If teachers are doing a lot less of the explaining up front because of the software, that frees them up to spend a lot more time intervening with students one-on-one -on -one at the right time for each individual student. It's really exciting to see schools thinking not just about the content that they need to teach, but also about the skills and the way that students apply knowledge, as well as even the mindsets they want their students to have. 
And the hope is that some of these blended learning techniques can actually free up times for teachers so they can actually spend more of their time on these mindsets and skills for students. And it actually aligns perfectly with the Common Core coming as well that's going to ask students to do more cognitively demanding work on their assessments. Now the teachers and staff at the schools we've been showing you think a lot about this role and how they get students to develop the content they need, the mindsets to be good learners, and the skills that they need to succeed. Um, I come from a family of teachers, so I talk about teaching a lot in schools a lot with, with people. Um, and so I think that there's two things about this system that have excited me the most and that I, I like talking about the most. Um, the first is the way that we've you know, really clearly identified those three big categories of things we want kids to learn. Content knowledge, the cognitive skills, and the non-cognitive skills. And, and, I mean, any teacher could tell you, like, yeah, absolutely, like, those things are important. I, I teach all those things in my class. But I love the fact that we have distinctly identified those and we've, you know, explicitly set aside time within the day for kids to work on those things so they know exactly what they're working on. One isn't getting lost in the other. Kids are getting really clear feedback on either their content knowledge or their cognitive skills or their non-cognitive skills. Um, and each of them gets that one-on-one -on -one time for a check-in so they know exactly what they're doing well and what they need to be working on. Thinking about how my role is kind of the same and how it's different, I think in terms of the differences, one big difference, obviously, is I'm not talking to kids right now as much about you know, specific content as I used to. And I'm not constantly worrying every single day, is like, is this one activity I did helping them learn the content? Um, you know, I'm creating playlists, so like, I'm definitely doing a lot of work to help kids learn content, but a lot of the, um, the onus of that has, has been put onto the kids. We see a trend in a lot of schools, not all schools, but a lot of schools doing blended learning, of teachers shifting from being generalists of all elements of teaching toward actually specializing on their strengths and the things that really excite them about getting into this profession in the first place. Now, many of you may remember the documentary Waiting for Superman, and the big problem, Brian, that I had with that movie was actually its title. The implication of it was that the only way to save our schools was to have a superhuman teacher inside of every single classroom that was doing lots and lots of different jobs that no human being could do within the constraints of a 45-minute period. Well, and you think instead, what if teachers could go after what they were best at? The person who just loves to lesson plan will use their great lessons all across the grade level and save every teacher from having to recreate the same lesson plan over and over and over again. The teacher who is that actor and loves the rapt attention of students can do more lecture, maybe have more students at a time, and free up other teachers to do different tasks. The teacher who's that data wonk who just loves assessment, let them go create the statistically reliable and valid assessment, but then use it across the school or even across a district. Play the teacher's strengths and let them specialize to the extent that they're comfortable or what's possible. Yeah, once you decide that every teacher doesn't have to have the same job, once you decide that every teacher doesn't have to pretend to be the master of 100,000 different things, which as humans we know is not possible, uh, it, it's really exciting. And what we see with a lot of teachers is some teachers really thrive in classroom culture and classroom management and other teachers really thrive in getting kids to love writing and other teachers really thrive in uh, uh, leading kids through a, you know, a song about mathematics and you know, really teaching them uh, different ways about thinking about math and one of the fun parts is let teachers play to their strengths. So that wraps up the five big shifts that Brian and I see happening as teachers move into these blended learning environments. And we hope this list has been provocative and spurred your thinking some. So we've introduced a lot of ideas about how the teacher's role changes as we move into these blended learning environments. And as we think about what are really mindset shifts, it's important as teachers to think about what can we do less of? And if there's one big idea I'd encourage people to let go of, it's the pacing guide. This concept that we're supposed to have every student moving at the same speed. I mean, our education system is virtually built on an assumption that we're the world's best astrologers. You say a student is born in the year of the rabbit, and therefore 15 years later, 
on October 27th. He's supposed to be ready to read Chapter 6 of Huck Finn, pages 68 to 71. Why not give a system that lets the student get that material at the right moment for them? Let the student control the pace. And to do this really well, it means that we as teachers can't just be one week ahead of where students are at any given point. We really, if we're going to let students self-direct their learning, have to have the entire roadmap laid out for them in advance so that they can drive this learning and keep moving at their own pace. Now, one important thing to remember is that there is still something important about setting a minimum pace so that students don't fall too far behind. There's a really great story that Dustin Hoffman told on stage when he was having a dying conversation with Laurence Olivier. And Laurence Olivier was talking to him and finally Dustin Hoffman said, Laurence, like, why did you go into acting? Why, what does this do for you? And he reached out and he held Dustin Hoffman's face and he said, look at me, look at me, look at me. And I think if we're honest as educators, we have a little bit of that. We want the attention on us. So an idea I'm going to encourage all of us to think about in a blended setting is we don't always need to be the focal point of the attention. We can turn students loose and let them work on different things. And if we do that, it frees us to not have this burden of managing the whole classroom in lockstep. We can be thinking in groups, and it actually could take down some of our stress level and let it be a little easier to work in smaller groups at a time, but still be incredibly productive. We hold students to a standard of productivity rather than lockstep attention on us. Now, another thing that teachers can start to move away from is feeling like you have to grade every single little task when, if we're being honest about it, some of the technology can actually start to take that burden off of us and just automate some of that grading. Um, also, the technology that we have, which is part of the blended learning, is giving me that I don't have to go home and grade tests and see who didn't get it. I know right away who didn't get it. And then it's fresh in their minds, and I can correct immediately what it was that they missed. We see schools doing lots of these little tiny tricks to save some teacher time. When a student comes in, automate the process of the do now launching of the class, or automate the collection of data at the exit ticket at the end of class. It's really all about taking something you used to do manually and seeing if there's a way to try to make it automatic, quicker, and save time for teachers. One story I always tell parents is that there's no reason that a teacher should ever write, administer, or grade a vocabulary test because we have computers that can do that better and faster and turn that data back to students immediately. Instead, our teachers are better able to focus on designing great lessons for kids and focusing on the project-based environment that we know is going to allow their skills to remain at the forefront of their learning experience. As we talk about these big shifts away from things that we used to do in traditional classrooms in these blended learning environments, three things we think stay the same. The first is a focus on culture. The second one is relationships, relationships, relationships. And the third one is those magical light bulb moments. So we talked about culture a lot today, and the thing that I just want to stress more than almost anything we've said about blended learning is that these schools nail culture. They are vibrant, joyful places that can also snap to attention when they need to and get down to work. So we want to show you some different kinds of classrooms and pay attention to how silent they can be when they want to be silent, how boisterous they can be but in total choral response with each other, and how teachers just zone in on what they want and expect students to get there and hold them to high expectations. But the unifying theme of culture permeates every school that we've been talking to you about in this whole course. The culture in a blended learning classroom is really essential. I think the biggest piece of culture is students knowing that every minute that they're spending with me and every minute they're spending on technology is intentional. So before they launch any program, before they do anything on technology, they know the purpose behind it. They know that this is helping me to grow my brain as a reader. They know that I'm practicing math facts because I need to practice my fluency with single digit addition.
Let's give her some shine on, shine on, because she's so much great. Shine on, shine on. When you have a student body that feels like a uniform group of people, almost like a team, you have the ability to teach faster and more and every second really counts in the school day versus so much time being lost in a traditional school. We get our kids into the classroom, they know that they need to be in their seats in 12 seconds and they need to be working on the do now that's on the board. When the students are in the computer lab, they know that in 15 seconds from when they walk through this, the door, they're counting down in their head, they should have their headphones on and be logged into their software program. And those are the types of things of student culture and um, efficiency at our schools that really lends itself to what is called bell-to-bell -bell learning, where there are never down times for the students. Ready, let's hit Almost there, got 100%. Eyes on me. Eyes on you. Last time, guys, third time's a charm. Ready, let's hit Share. Okay. The quickest deposit you've ever done in your entire life. Deposit. Deposit. That was pretty quick.